Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar. My name is Hilary Beach. I am a consultant at Home Sackett in Wagga Wagga. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We are discussing uh, drench resistance in cattle with Dr. John Webware of the McKinnon Project. Um, so uh, I'll just run you through the platform. For those who um, are joining us for the first time tonight, this control panel will be at the top right corner of your screen. Uh, at the top left hand corner of the control panel, there is a red arrow that should collapse and reinstate the control panel uh, in case you wanna get a better look at the screen. You should be able to hear us, but we cannot hear you. So please type your questions in the box provided. Please make your questions as succinct as possible and I will, will relay them to John uh, at the end of the webinar. So just to introduce tonight's speaker, we have Dr. John Webb Webb. Uh, John is a senior consultant at the University of Melbourne, um, Melbourne's McKinnon Project. He advises to sheep and beef producers in Southern Australia on all aspects of farm management. He presents regularly to farming groups and is involved with various farm management and agricultural related committees. John also undertakes uh, teaching of veterinary and agricultural students at the University of Melbourne. On top of this, John also runs a 6,000 DSE beef and sheep property in Melbourne, uh, on the fringe of Melbourne and uh, in partnership with his family in his spare time. So we're very lucky to have John uh, with us tonight. Um, to discuss drench resistance in cattle. And I will make John the presenter. Okay. And can you hear me? I can hear you, John. Yep. If you just want to put your presentation into PowerPoint mode. Okay. Yep. There we go. Yeah, so okay. you might just want to swap your screen over. Yep. Okay. So I'll do that in sharing. Yep, that's right. Yep, that's right. Um, I Okay, is that right? No, it looks great. Thanks, John. Okay, I'm ready to go. Thanks very much, Hilary. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to be here this evening to talk on a, a an emerging topic for the industry, but it's actually been um, an issue for quite some years now. And I think for beef producers, it, it's a really important thing in high rainfall areas to understand what, what's happening with drench resistance and how we should be managing it. So I, I wanna go, initially just wanna give a bit of a brief background of effective worm control uh, in a cattle and, and talk about how widespread drench resistance is in cattle, how you can detect it and, and also, and how to actually manage it, I think it's really important um, for, for beef producers. So that's the nuts and the bolts of what I'll be talking to you for the next half hour or so. So in terms of um, the, uh, just a, a bit of the background, I just want to talk about the relative importance of different worms. Now, Ostertagia or small brown stomach worm is by far the most important. It's the most pathogenic worm and it's very widespread in, in, in southeastern and eastern Australia. Um, it, it is a worm which is a bit tricky in that it has lower egg output. So in terms of from a monitoring perspective, you, you actually often can miss it a bit because it is um, uh, of this lower egg output. Often you hear people talking about cuperia. It, it's certainly often picked up with monitoring worm burdens in cattle, but it, 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 it isn't nearly as important as Ostertagia. Um, and so because you, you can have cattle with quite low egg output, 
and still have significant worm burdens in them and causing significant production losses. So I'll talk a bit, bit about that more later on. Another uh, worm in cattle which does raise its head occasionally is stomach hair, hair worm or trichelos strongless axii. It's, it, does, it, it is one of the worms which does cross um, with sheep. And so sometimes we see issues with sheep um, where they've had uh, been grazing country which has only had cattle previously. So, but it's more of a background thing. We don't, it's, it doesn't rate nearly as highly. Um, I just want to mention uh, Barber's pole um, uh, or homonchus. Now there, there is two, there is a cattle worm homonchus blasii, which we see particularly in Northern um, regions up in Northern Australia, which is important. And also uh, homonchus contortus, which is the sheep Barber's pole version which is a, obviously a very serious um, worm for the, uh, those people aware of it in sheep, with, with sheep. And you can get some crossover with sheep and I'll talk a bit about that later on as well. So they're the worms, Ostatagia is, is right up there, the most important uh, one. And in terms of life cycle, I just reckon it's worthwhile just taking a step back and understanding just a bit about it. Um, when uh, eggs go out, the larvae, worm larvae hatching are done quite quick, quickly between four and 12 days in summer, but it can take uh, um, between five and 10 uh, weeks in winter when conditions are cool and moist and, and just uh, when you've got a really wet dung pad, it just, it, it slows the development. But you must have moisture to complete the life cycle. Um, what's, what's, and this is a really important one. In summer, the, once the eggs hatch, Larvae can survive for at least five months quite happily in dung pets. Uh, but if they're outside of dung pet, they don't survive that long at all. So they're quite protected in dung pets. And I guess if you look at it, I mean, it's one thing with um, your dung beetles, breaking down dung pets is probably a beneficial thing in terms of reducing uh, surviving larvae on pastures in summer. Um, but, but it's important thing in terms of um, Contaminated paddocks could still be contaminated at the end of summer, which is a bit different to sheep in that um, the, the larvae are very resilient in, in the dung pets. When you get to the cooler, wet, moister autumn period, the pasture larval counts tend to peak about six to eight weeks post the autumn break. And, and they'll survive pretty well right through to um, uh, when conditions warm up in spring. Um, and, and when once larvae are, are ingested on pasture, uh, they become an egg laying adult themselves within three weeks, particularly in younger cattle. So just remember that as a bit of a background. In terms of where, worm egg output in, in cattle, um, mostly in young stock, um, and, and egg counts of typically less than 500 eggs per gram. Often if they're over a thousand eggs per gram, look, you're gonna have more than likely gonna have sick cattle depending on the worm species present. Um, cattle over 12 to 15 months, the egg output is still is quite low, but that can still, even an egg count of two eggs per gram per beast, can still constitute 50,000 eggs per day. So you can still get moderate pasture contamination. And as I mentioned, Nostatagi has got lower uh, egg output compared to Caperia um, and, and Barber's Pole. So, just with regard to Ostatagi again, the type, there's a couple of different types of disease. In young cattle up to 15, perhaps 18 months at the latest, you would get what we call type one disease. So larvae picked up directly go through to um, egg laying adults and damage the gut. And they'll respond pretty well to treatment um, straight away. Then there's pre-type two. So when you get late winter, early spring, uh, increase in day length. Larvae picked up tend to become in, arrested in the gut lining of cattle over about 15 months. And whilst they sit in the gut lining, they, they won't cause any clinical signs or issues at all. But what happens occasionally in, in, in mature cattle, particularly um, heifers, um, um, autumn calving heifers at the point of calving or spring calving, cows with the first calf at foot, so two and a half years old. The larvae which are sitting in the gut line can emerge in massive numbers and cause really rapid, rapid um, weight loss and, and bottle jaw. And 
you could easily lose 50 to 100 kilograms in a very short period of time. It's nothing more disappointing than doing everything right nutritionally and then suddenly lose an extra 50 kilos or possibly even more with a, in a condition score and suddenly have to do more feeding in order to occasionally um, have, have losses. It's particularly in first, uh, first and second carvers, occasionally bulls, uh, but any mature age group of, uh, of cows, uh, if they're under nutritional stress, uh, are at, at risk of this. You'd see it particularly in areas, I reckon, above about a 600 mil rainfall. And the lower rainfall areas, I just don't think there's a larval pickup to, 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 for those worms to accumulate in the gut lining. But it's particularly emergence in autumn where that occurs. And I've seen some this autumn already um, on, on places uh, in young cattle and also um, and often you see those those first carvers, you think, gee, they've lost some weight uh, quickly. And often there's a background of um, uh, type two osteotagia happening. So just those the diseases. I mean, why are worms important? This is some, some trials we did about, but it's about 10 years ago now, but it really makes a point. So this is weaner cattle in northeast Victoria, and and we tried, um, um, and, and this was with. Um, three different drench, uh, drench groups plus an untreated group. And there was a difference over winter and early spring of about, well, it was, look, effectively it's about um, four or 500 grams a day. Um, wasn't a big difference between the different drench groups, the weight gain, but there was a consistently a big drench uh, difference in weight gain with the controls um, over that period of time. Um, another scenario, um, and just one other thing, sorry, with that first scenario. See the average egg count in the trial was only 60 eggs per gram. So I guess I'm making a point here, and particularly for those familiar uh, people familiar with sheep, is that egg counts in cattle are quite dangerous. So I think you have to look closely at the cattle as well, not just at the egg count, particularly where there's just osteotagia involved. And here's another trial uh, over the same period, 50 eggs per gram half a kilogram difference in weight gain, no difference, significant difference between the different drench groups, uh, but, but half a kilogram per day difference in weight gain with the control group um, over that winter spring period. Um, in, um, here's a trial where there's actually zero egg count, um, uh, and we checked this a few times because we were a bit surprised, but there was an interest in that there was no difference uh, uh, between the weight gain of the control group and the drench group. So clearly these, cattle were drenched um, at weaning uh, in, in autumn on the very clean pastures and they didn't have the uh, potential to pick up any because uh, uh, the, uh, there was no worm larvae to pick up over winter and so no production consequence. Um, and here's um, another one where just in a, um, the, the weight gain over the period of time from May to November, the pastures were pretty ordinary, um, egg counts were pretty low. Um, um, and, and only about 10% showed up as ostatagia. But an, a proportion of larvae, you can see at 12% ostatagia, that doesn't reflect truly on, on the total worm count in the animal. There could be still 80% of the total worm burden could still be ostatagia. They just, just don't have the egg output. So in this trial between, and they were drenched at the start, but no subsequent uh, drenching, there was a um, there was a, again a difference between the um, control and the uh, different drench groups. And I, I know if you don't look all of them, um, uh, it wasn't the ML drenches which were necessarily the best performing one. There wasn't much difference between the groups. Levamazole in this group was a, bit, a little bit low, uh, lower the weight gain, but still there's, there's quite substantial differences. I mean, at current cattle prices, I mean, you, you're looking at, at 30 kilos, uh, is easily um, um, 120, 130 dollars at the end of uh, end of the year. So very substantial differences in um, income. Here's a, just wanted to show you briefly. This is uh, a trial. Which, this is actually part of a product development many years ago. But I, I guess I wanted to just show you. This is what these were undrenched cattle through the year uh, and um, weaner cattle and what. Um, is Im important to note is that the egg counts peaked in, in, in June, July, and then just gradually were pretty steady over the rest of uh, late winter, early spring, and then dropped off in October. But um, the actual um, proportion of the um, larvae in all, were, 
um, you know, 70 Yet there was only about 10% of the actual larvae in, in the cattle were ostatagia. So I guess it's trying to make that point. Yeah, just because you, you have low egg counts, ostatagia could still be causing significant uh, damage. And the same deal later on. What happens? Cuperia tends to peak earlier in terms of egg out, then uh, gradually ostatagia takes over. But, but still, in, in terms of total worm burden, and these had several hundred thousand ostatagia in the total worm counts. The cattle, look, they were, they didn't perform particularly well. They were, they were, they were clearly, they were showing the effects of worms, but um, um, and there would have been a great response to drenching, but just it's a point to show how important ostatagia can be. So in terms of just with that background, it's all about ostatagia, is, 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 is just to understand the background of uh, drench resistance. And look, and a lot of those, that's producers listening um, who have got um, um, sheep will understand how widespread dredge resistance is in sheep. Um, I've said emerging problem in cattle. I think that's actually ancient history to be perfectly honest. Um, first, it was noted in dairy calves um, and there was a reason why that is because dairy producers were often drenching um, their young potty calves um, um, every, uh, two to four weeks and so incredibly high challenge uh, and, and selection pressure for resistance. Uh, but and certainly there's um, widespread evidence across the world, New Zealand, Europe, USA, South America, it's all the same story. Widespread and, and there's really widespread evidence um, uh, in beef cattle in Australia now. Um, and, and, and why is it, and, and particularly uh, why is it happening? Well. I mean, for the, since about 1987, I think it was, when the first Ivermec Avermec uh, drench came out for cattle, which is a macrocyclic lactone group or ML group. Um, it, it's been the predominant product used for the last 30, 30 odd years. So, and, and with little use of other um, registered products. And so we've been, had very high selection pressure because of, because of that. But why why is it taken so long to develop compared to sheep? Well, there's a couple of really important reasons. One is there's less frequent drenching in, in cattle compared to the sheep, although you could debate that in the dairy industry. Um, and also there's another thing is is that with the remember with that the, the larvae can survive very nicely in, in dung pats in cattle, but uh, or even over summer, uh, what we call refugia. So it's actually quite a high proportion of the total. Uh, worm population, which is in in uh, sitting in, the, in in dung pats and that sort of stuff, whereas in sheep you get a lot higher mortality of larvae on pasture in summer. So there's actually been higher exposure to to drenching in sheep because there's more a higher proportion of the worms are actually in the sheep rather than on pasture. So that, those two factors alone are really important. But just in terms of we know a lot of the sheep drenches they start to fall over after about 20 uses of a drench in on a commercial property. Now, and the, and the reality is you look at a lot of people don't drench mature cows and that's fine. So I mean, on average, a lot of cattle only get another two drenches a year, where it's probably more like three to uh, four drenches a year. Although in Barber's Bowl areas, it's a lot higher. Um, the other thing which I, I reckon has been an issue with really little awareness and adoption of, of, of the recognition of these issues is this, low egg output, so it's harder to actually measure it. Um, and particularly egg counts in cattle over 12 or 15 months from what when they become um, arrested in the gut lining, egg, egg counts are very low, whereas they've still got some use in sheep. So, and, and, and also with the value of cattle, there's less opportunity to do post-mortems and total worm counts, and, which is a hell of a big job to count all the worms in cattle when you do it. But, you can, you can do it, but it's just a really difficult job, so it's just not done nearly as much. And also, um, the other thing is that it's more tricky to do a drench trial because we don't often have high enough egg counts. Look, so how do we do a drench trial? And so what we do often, and the best group is to target, say, calves at weaning, um, which are undrenched, and, and ideally they've got egg counts of a couple of hundred eggs per gram. And would allocate ideally to groups of 15 to 20, which is more than what we'd do with the sheep because 
the egg counts are lower. So we need more numbers to get the power to interpret the results. And typically you'd have a, a control group, you'd have an ML group such as whichever one you're commonly using, uh, abamectin um, or, or moxidectin or whatever, a white drench, um, oxfentazole or, or the like, and a clear drench such as lovamazole, I think is yes. So you have four groups. Um, and then um, if you know you've got high, high enough egg counts, then you do your drenches um, uh, to body weight, and then you collect individual faecal egg counts after about 14 days, and then um, send the samples to the lab and, and see how the reduction in uh, the individual groups compares to the control group to determine um, the level of resistance. Look, at the end of the day, it's a pretty crude test, but it's, it's what we've got to do, and it is useful. Just in terms of how widespread resistance is, I mean, look, and there's a Victorian study which was combined with a few, few different groups, including McKinnon, in there, but, but uh, with 60, 66% uh, 60 of properties, and this was sort of done five or six years ago, 66% of properties had resistance to at least one drench product in Western Australia, 88% of pro properties had resistance to at least one drench product in New Zealand, it was up at 93 but it's a little wonder with the extra drenching they do over there. Um, and what um, worm species were resistant? In Victoria, um, there was to all groups, but Ostertagia predominantly to uh, the ML group and Ivermectin was used in the trials because it's the least potent of the drenches, so they're likely to be the first to fall over with resistance. Eight out of 30 had white drench resistance and nine out of 16 had uh, Levamazole wasn't uh, effective. And, and likewise in Caperia, half with ML resistance, but less so with uh, white drench or Levamazole. In, even in tri Trichostrongulus, in the trials where there was a bit of Trichostrongulus, there was a low level of resistance. Uh, but in the, in the trials we did, um, which were done, and I've seen it since, so where there was an abamectin or Levamazole, and this was actually a poor one, uh, it was 100% effective. Um, uh, but we did find interesting between the MLs are pretty variable between the different uh, products and whether it be poron or injectables. Um, and interestingly, there's a New Zealand study done uh, uh, some years ago now, which, which clearly showed in cattle, oral moxidectin was uh, more potent than either the poron or injectable uh, moxidectins. And it's postulated that just there was a higher um, concentration of chemical uh, in the gut. Uh, which stands to reason, uh, which 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 killed uh, more worms compared to the poron products, which had to work systemically and, and injectable products as well. And, and poron was probably the least effective injectable, and the oral product was the most effective. But I think the, it, it says a bit of a story with that. Um, and I know obviously the the porons are uh, wonderfully uh, easy to do, but there is a sting in the tail there, which is a bit of a concern. And here's a trial with a, a group of 10 properties in Victoria. Now the definition of resistance is 95% reduction in worm egg count, um, greater than 95% reduction in worm egg count, plus a few other little statistical quirks, but we'll just keep it at that. But I would say when, when the MLs first came out, they killed, it always came back as zero egg, eggs, so they were 100% effective. So even at 95% reduction, the horses really started to bolt, and it it it, it could be that fifty percent of the the worm population has resistant genes in it. So whilst that's a a, a cut off ninety five percent for the definition definition of resistance, uh, that the horse is already bolting. You can see there's a lot below the red line in that graph there, um, uh, whether it be the mectins or levamazole or um, the white white trenches in some cases. Um, so, and here's a, just an example of a drench trial um, where the control group had an average of 94 eggs per gram. So immediately let's say, oh, look, treat these results with caution because it's such a low count, but you just, we had decent numbers, so we could use it. Um, in, in the white group, there was only uh, an average, and we did individual counts of one egg per gram, so 99% reduction. So it's still okay. Ivermectin was 86% reduction and Abamectin was 100% reduction. It is more potent, but um, uh, than uh, than ivermectin, and, and so still susceptible. With, clearly, with ivermectin, uh, ivermectin um, um, based on the sheep story, won't be that far behind. So, 
just with regard to the dredge choices, MLs are, um, uh, so you've got ivermectin, less potent than abamectin, which theoretically moxidectin, doramectin and epinectin um, are slightly more potent. But and I, I mentioned before the in, injectable versus poron versus oral and in the good New Zealand work, which clearly showed the orals. Uh, were, were more effective. Um, and MLs as a group, they're effective against an inhibitor larvae as long as there isn't bad resistance there. So that's important for the control of worms in um, adults um, 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 uh, in, in controlling that type two um, um, infection. With the um, white trenches, oxfendazole, penbendazole, um, uh, they're also effective against the inhibitor larvae in the gut lining, um, and they're a useful alternative to rare mills, that's for sure. Uh, clear trenches, like levamazole, um, are not effective against inhibitor larvae because they effectively just act to paralyze the worm and it passes through. But, but even so, um, they can be very useful in young stock up to 12 to 15 months of age. And, and, and now I think what, what's coming on, you've got combinations, there is, um, commercial uh, uh, combinations which are registered in cattle and also there's a lot of people now starting to use uh, the triple combinations which are used uh, widely in, in, in sheep such as uh, abamectin or moxidectin plus um, um, uh, a, a benzimidazole and a white and a clear drench as a triple combination as an oral drench and a lot of people groan at the thought of oral drenching but um, a lot of people have got used to it again and think it's actually not a big deal, so they're pretty happy with it. Uh, but it helps to have good facilities, there's no uh, um, doubt about that. So in terms of, th this is just a checklist of the things which if you go away with nothing else, have a revisit this list and imagine managing dredge resistance. I reckon it's really important. Um, and so number one, in terms of weigh and dose to the heaviest in the mob, that's really important. Um, and also check your applicator um, is giving the correct dose. Now, I remember talking to the field day some years ago now, and I got everybody to bring along um, applicators and, and just uh, their, their drink, just to see if they worked. And I think there was, there was, there was about 20 people brought along um, uh, drench guns, and, and this was a sheep example, but it very much holds true to cattle. Uh, 13 of the 20 weren't delivering the correct dose. So I think it's a really important point, not only at the start of when you drench, but as you're going through the mob, also recheck because things can happen and seals can uh, bugger up and that sort of stuff. So they're really just 101 really important things. Um, I think with, with cattle, um, obviously there's a reason why we haven't got the resistance to the level of sheep, but we, we, we'll get there, no doubt about it. Is But one thing is don't over drench. So, and I'll, I'll talk, just finish off in, in some of the what, what key drenches which should, should be considering, but um, and, and really be mindful of not over drenching. But and I think it's really important, the fundamental thing is to understand what the drench resistance status of the worms in your property is. At the very least, if you, even if you don't do a full drench trial, check 10 to 14 days post uh, of a mob where you know they had moderate egg counts to start with. Um, of young cattle, I'm talking here, less uh, 12 months uh, and younger, ideally. And uh, or ideally do a full dredge trial. A uh, bit of fiddling around, but I think it's a worthwhile exercise. And I think the other thing which is important to consider moving forward is rather than concentrate on the MLs alone, I think we should be looking at um, 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 uh, uh, of the MLs. So I, I don't like using the ivermectin alone because it just it's a less potent uh, chemical compared to the other ones. But um, uh, but I think um, I think now that we use the um, um, combinations rather than the MLs alone, and ideally a triple combination, but even a um, ML plus uh, Lavamazole using the commercial one is fine. Um, and I think really, and also the other thing here is, if you're buying cattle, absolutely critical not to buy in somebody else's issue. So use a, a, a triple combination at the very least for purchased cattle, and I think that should be mandatory. Um, and and and, and also the other thing, apart from using combinations, which is been, um, there is a lot of debate with regard to its ability using combinations to slow, slow the emergence of drench resistance. And I think that is, is, is certainly true. And I know in, on cheap 
uh, flocks, we, we do an annual rotation of effective uh, drenches as well. So use one product for the year, change to the next product for the following year. It seems to work. Some people chop and change. I think combinations is probably the more important, but I think um, particularly in, in, the, in the younger stock. But, um, and, and with the quarantine drenching, it's, 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 it's a not negotiable. I just, and also I think even with the triple combination, it's probably not a bad idea to do a worm egg count 10 days later to make sure it is gone back, it is zero for the new cattle. And also, I, I'm just going to mention, I'm not going to talk about it now, but um, also if, if you're buying cattle from a fluky area and you're drenching them, um, uh, there's limited products uh, which are effective against fluke and there's widespread resistance with triclobendazole, the best product for, for fluke. And so you don't, again, if you've got fluky country, you don't want to buy somebody else's fluke onto your property. So uh, just check uh, fluke, fluke counts at zero too. Um, if you use, uh, using a, a fluke trench. Um, just other issues um, with uh, drench resistance. Uh, look, the production consequences appear to be only moderate because the level of resistance is moderate. But there was one trial I looked at um, in a paper done recently, um, I think it was in South America, which showed that where there was a product which was only 50% um, effective, the there was a, about a, t um, a 20 kilogram lower growth rate, which is very significant. And even using a product which was 70%, there was, I think it was about, about a five or 10 kilogram difference in weight gain compared to using effective products. So just be mindful, um, if you're not using effective trenches, um, apart from wasting your time, you, you're going to have production consequences, which will only get worse with time. I just want to make a comment about long acting products, and I know a lot of people love them because they're labour saving and convenience. But I'm just mindful with the, uh, the long acting products, really, we're talking uh, long acting moxidectin and, and the like. Um, and I think, um, oh, look, they're a great product, but I, I wouldn't be relying on them every year. I'd really be focusing on trying to keep where your young cattle are going on low contaminated pastures so you don't have to uh, consider them necessary. But but perhaps in really high challenge years, yeah, they might be worthwhile and that sort of stuff. But I think grazing management is a really important part of the whole story there uh, to minimise your, your, your reliance on that product. So I just want to mention another thing with drench resistance. It relates to sheep, and which I've seen a, a, a bit of this in recent times where people have purchased cattle, particularly, say, from Barbers pole areas, say like the Tablelands of New South Wales, and they've judiciously given them uh, what they consider a potent ML on the arrival of those uh, cattle to their property. Uh, but unfortunately, the Barbers pole strain in the sheep is highly resistant to a lot of different drenches. And young cattle can carry the sheep um, Barbers pole, not so much older cattle, but young cattle certainly can. And, and if, you're, if you drench them with an ML and you've got highly resistant worms, well, regardless of the cattle, but if you're introducing that barber's pole uh, to your flock uh, and you've got sheep in your property, well, I think it's really it's a really critical issue. So suddenly the sheep flock on that property's got issues with barber's pole where they didn't before. Um, so I, I think um, it, it's another reason to use combinations when you're purchasing cattle. And also check 10 days post to make sure that it's, it's fully effective at the very least. So just finishing up on a few key elements of worm control. Uh, I think I'll break it down into um, four areas, strategic drenching to prevent worm problems, monitoring and grazing management, and, and also monitoring and manage drench resistance, which we've talked about. But I mean, with strategic drenching, the principle is to maintain Low, low worm larvae on pasture. And so the timing of drench is, um, is really important. Um, and, and so we're trying to do that drench when we've got our biggest impact and less reliance on on uh, chasing your tail with drenching, 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 because they're always getting wormy. Um, and I mean, the principle is avoid grazing young cattle on contaminated pastures and, and balance um, and obviously nutrition is an important part of this equation, but um, and obviously timing to a degree depends on the local environment and time of calving. Um, but in terms of just for spring calving herds, and this is above, this is a southeastern southern Australia type scenario for spring calving herds. 
where um, your weaners, you drench them at, at, at weaning, uh, not negotiable. Uh, it might be anywhere between January and April you, uh, in tough years, sort of January, February, and good years it might be a touch later. Um, May, June, they're ready for another drench almost certainly. Again, this is in high rainfall areas and late winter again, another drench is almost certain. Very unlikely that you'll need, once they're 12 months old, further drenching, uh, except if it's, uh, if it's really poor nutrition, which is probably less likely in September. The other one, which of these herds is the first and second calvers, is, is a summer drench to stop that risk of type two. So particularly the group which have got their first calves that put um, drench at weaning or don't go too late, April's too late, um, preferably go in January, possibly February, but the type two happens a bit later. Occasionally in really tough, tough years, I'll drench heifers um, pre-calving. In a good year with good nutrition, we generally don't worry. And mature cows, it's a case by case basis. Um, good years, you might spot drench a few skinny ones. In tough years, you, depending on my property history, you might drench or with a summer drench. Bulls, they're, they're more susceptible to worms, particularly when they get in light condition. And even compared to steers, uh, presumably due to hormonal impact or stress or something, but they can carry high worm burden. So just be mindful, don't forget your bulls. Um, with the autumn carvers, it's slightly different. Um, you drench at weaning, whether it be November, December, uh, that's a not negotiable. And then in areas where um, where it's dry over summer, there shouldn't be any drench required, perhaps and often the steers are off the place, but drench the heifers uh, pre-joining in, in May, June, and you'd only ever do one late winter if it's a tough year, because they're now over 15 months old, 15 to 18 months old, so they should be resilient to that type, type one infection. Um, first and second carvers, um, and not negotiable uh, pre-carving, um, and mature cows, um, you're more likely to have to give autumn carvers a pre-carving drench than spring carvers, uh, because they're coming under nutritional stress going into calving. Um, uh, but it, it's a history of property case by case basis and bulls the same story with the other ones, uh, uh, with the spring carvers. Monitoring, I, I, I haven't emphasised enough, I still, worm counts are unreliable uh, because of that is issue of overwhelming with cuperia, but they still have some use in young cattle. Um, so I, I think, the important thing is just don't rely on alone. Look at the cattle. Uh, are they looking wormy? Are they scouring and all that sort of stuff? You can do blood tests, but it costs and it's a bit of fiddling around. Um, uh, but it can you, you can measure gut damage um, using blood blood pepsinogen. Um, but I think it's also important to be mindful of if you keep to that program which I'm talking about, and which obviously individual places you tweak it. Uh, but look at um, assess the performance. Are, are they performing well? Uh, remembering 50 eggs per gram still might be an issue. Uh, grazing management is really important. Uh, just want to mention that sort of misconception. Um, if you're rotating around a, a block every five weeks uh, to 10 weeks, we, there's still going to be plenty of worm larvae in that pasture after that period of time. So it's not going to clean up a wormy paddock after five to 10 weeks. Uh, low worm risk paddocks will be new pastures will be fodder crops and hay and silage aftermath are often pretty good. Um, and also the other one, which I always call a free kick for those people who have got sheep, right, swapping over every six months. There's some great work done in the 70s up in New England, which clearly showed a really valuable um, benefit of swapping sheep and cattle. Often you drench the sheep uh, with the changeover, but there was 10% increase in production uh, for both the sheep and, and young cattle with that sort of strategy. So. Don't, don't forget that. Some people are limited where they can run their sheep and cattle and all that sort of stuff, but it is a really good opportunity. I think I've said enough. I mean, look, the message, trench resistance, it is widespread in cattle. I think it's important that you should understand the status for your farm so you can tweak your worm control program. And the other thing, it's going to, I mean, look, using trenches, um, it is an inevitable, inevitable consequence of resistance is, um, of, of using trenches is trench resistance. So it will continue to develop. But as we know from the sheep can that scenario, we've dealt with properties for 30 years which have had bad resistance and they've still got very good worm control. It's a matter of understanding what your status is and acting accordingly. So thanks very much. Then perhaps we'll hand over for questions.
Great, thanks, John. That was great. Yeah. Well, you might just want to mute your audio while I talk. There's a bit of feedback there, if you can, John. Mute. Uh, there should be a yeah. below the red arrow on the left hand side, there should be a microphone icon. Uh, or just under audio. That That's right, it seems to have gone now anyway. Um, okay, thanks very much, John. Um, we've got a few questions flowing in, um, but I'll just give John a bit of a break um, for a few seconds. Um, those of you who are asking, these webinars are recorded uh, and they are available on the MLA website under Extension Training and Tools, I believe. Uh, so if you want to rehash um, a bit of the topic of tonight um, or any of the previous webinars, jump on the MLA website um, while you're doing your social distancing and um, have, a, have a gander at those. Um, so we'll jump into questions. Um, you should be right, John, to unmute yourself. We'll see how we go. Um, few, the first few questions um, were asked early on, and I think you did cover them, but we'll just um, quickly rehash them. The first one from Trevor, do animals uh, 12 to 18 months of age need drenching? Um, most definitely in higher rainfall country. Different thing out in the pastoral zone where no drenching might be required, but certainly uh, above uh, 550, 600 millimetre the rainfall, they more than likely need an additional drench apart from just a drench at weaning. And I think if you refer back to that timing of drenching, I think it's a pretty useful guide, and that's for above a 600 mil rainfall area. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Trevor. Uh, the next one from Adam. Uh, valid that Ostatagia is a major worm. However, a large quantity of egg counts in my area shows that it is 14% of the burden and Cuparia is 30% plus, with the highest being Barber's pole. Do you think that faecal egg testing is paramount and is Cuparia um, not an insignificant parasite? Look. There, there's no doubt uh, that cuperia can cause small production losses, but just where you said it was 14% of, say, Ostatagi was only 14% of the actual egg output based on larval culture or PCR uh, to differentiate the worm species, you could still have 80 or 90% of Ostatagia in uh, as being the total worm numbers in the actual animal itself so just it's because their egg output is low barber's pole has got higher egg output and it is more um it is it can be uh, very significant um as well um so look i, I think it, it's useful to understand it, it, that yeah cuperia shows up particularly in the younger animals and it, it doesn't mean you don't drench but just be mindful when you it's probably more an issue, I reckon, when you've got low egg counts, that the actual, like I said, I mean, a 50 egg per gram, but these were sort of 12 to 13, or eight to 13 month old animals, 14 month old animals, were clearly getting production responses from drenching. Um, um, and it's hard to differentiate specifically the relative production response from each, each specific worm, but, I do emphasise, I guess, be careful with interpreting those egg counts. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question from Felicity. Um, are you aware of a registered triple combo oral drench for cattle? Look, I'm not. Um, I, I look, I know I might, I'm pretty sure I'm not, but what I have been, a lot of, like quite a lot of clients have been using is the uh, sheep um uh products at the appropriate dose rate for cattle um to do that triple combination there's certainly commercial uh products such as abamectin uh, levamazole um poron eclipse is, is one example um but i don't think i'm aware of a triple combination there is talk of them coming out but they may well be out um already but i suspect they will be out over the next few years but uh, in the meantime, the sheep product, making sure you're using 
the um, dose rate of the drench at the cattle dose rate and that sort of stuff. But it is offline, uh, off label because they're not necessarily registered. The products are registered to cattle. But I think we just need to be mindful um, uh, of that in terms of ESIs and that sort of thing. It's really important. And I'd, before using products, consult with your um, animal health advisor on, on what's appropriate where you've, uh, you haven't got um, products which are working on your farm. Okay, so it's just seek advice to clarify for your particular situation. I think it's really important. Yeah, very much so. Thank you, John. Uh, the next question from Greg is moxidectin the only dung beetle friendly chemical? Yeah, look, I, I think it's a bit of a marketing thing. Look, I, I think the whole residual activity, of, and it was a really big thing pushed with moxidectin when it first came out in cattle. But I think given the drench frequency of, of in cattle um, um, and the time that it might be an issue, uh, I think it's such a small window for the whole year. And on all properties, there's a whole plethora of different dung beetles which are active and, and they have different life cycles and different timings. And so my view in the overall scheme of thing, it's a third tier issue because I think it's not going to, not everybody in Australia is going to go and treat at the same time where a particular dung beetle is active, are they? So I think it's probably not as, it's, 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 it's sort of obviously a, a marketing ploy and, and there's reasons that can be argued for it, but I think it's really in the overall scheme of things, it's, it's, it's not particularly important, okay? All right, thanks, John. Uh, the next one from Michael, good question. Will paddocks be clean after a fire has gone through? Uh, good question. And I'm, I'm sure local heat intensity will um, reduce the worm burden on that, cat, uh, on that paddock or on that area substantially. Unfortunately, it won't eradicate, which would be nice uh, because worm larvae, they, they migrate in random motion and some of them will be actually underneath the earth's surface, surface so uh, soil surface so uh, um, protected from um, um, the, the um, temperature of the fire and uh, what have you uh, by that physical barrier but uh, the reality is yeah you'll have much lower worm challenge on those paddocks for a while but it won't be eliminating the worms. Interesting. Thanks for the question, Michael. Uh, the next one from um, Perina or Perina, sorry, not sure. Um, we have had lungworm problems. What would be the best practice going forward? Um, depends on what particular lungworm. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, the life cycle. Often you'll get them where they've been really worm-free environment and then get exposed and hit them quite severely. You, you, you see lungworm, there's, there's a couple of different species uh, over in Europe where you've got shedded, it's a major issue where you've got shedded cattle in barns over uh, the winter and they come out and get whacked with lungworm when they go into pastures in, in summer. Importantly, most of the uh, drenches available will um, um, uh, protect <laughs> Uh, will are effective against lungworm. Uh, I know in sheep, uh, monopantal or Zolvix is um, slightly less efficacious for lungworm uh, compared to other other products, but um, but um, certainly most of the other ones uh, have some e efficacy. But depends on which type of lungworm you're talking about. We don't see often see big problems, but. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd immediately start to think: Is there an issue in the background? Why you're getting more, more problems on your particular farm? And and so that'd be an interesting one to follow up because it is is not that common. We occasionally see issues, but not that common. All right. Thanks for the question. Bit of free there. Uh, next question from Felicity: When selecting a drench, should we focus on one that has a longer effective control period on Ostatagia rather than Cuparia? I would focus on um, Ostatagia personally as being the most important one. Now, the thing is, what, what's the most effective? Um, the, the, the protection periods really are generally pretty, again, a pretty 
second tier issues, I reckon, that, that, that where one lasts for five days and then another one lasts for 13 or 14 days. I mean, obviously with the long acting products where they can, um, they've got, um, say, long acting um, moxidectin up to 100 days, it's a, a different kettle of fish and that's against Ostatagia. But, but I guess um, um, what the critical thing there, I guess, is to understand what the resistance status of the particular worm species on, on your farm is to clarify that completely. It's really interesting when we're looking through all the trials done with whole variety of different products. I mean, there's, there's often not the standout product which is really in front of everything else when you're talking the MLs. Um, I know um, with um, the uh, BZ uh, drenches, um, and this was never published unfortunately in Norman Edison, who did the work when he was with CSRO many years ago, found that oxvendazole was more potent than albendazole, for example, against um, inhibitor larvae um, in, in, in cattle, um, um, which was quite interesting. I think the oxvendazole was 95% uh, effective against uh, inhibitor larvae, and, and uh, the albendazole was about uh, substantially less than that. But uh, the work was never published, but it was uh, an interesting one, and uh, certainly I don't think that work's ever been done since. Great. Uh, we've got a lot of questions here, John, so strap yourself in. Um, Michael <laughs> would like to know, could the use of multiple drenches in sequence be better than a combination drench, i.e. use clear drench, then ML one month later or something like that? Look, there, there, there's a bit of debate here in the academic com community, but I think the consensus is that combination drenches are pretty are probably better um, uh, in terms of delaying resistance than using chopping and changing uh, sort of thing. Just saying, using a levamazole one and then a, a BZ the next and so on, and then an ML the next. So the combinations are probably technically preferable um, to start from day one. And I mean, look, in the ideal world, if we had two completely new products developed, they'd come out in combination. Um, uh, rather than using as individual products um, and the selection pressure of a resistance would theoretically be slower. But a lot of this is based on modelling rather than real life experience, but I think the logic of it's pretty sound. So I guess the answer is combinations are probably more preferable. And I'll certainly, I know in, in, in sheep, it's been some years since I've even considered using individual uh, ML trenches in, in, uh, on, on sheep properties. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question from Marcus. Are you suggesting drenching first carvers in January just prior to winning uh, off their calf? Look, I, I think what the reality is you do it at, um, um, this is a conversation I have with people all the time. You do it obviously in, in one action. So when you when you wean, um, you, do, you, you um, drench them. Now, I think I've seen properties where they've done that drench in December for some reason, and I reckon it's a bit too early if you're still getting a bit of worm pickup off pastures, so they can still get some inhibited larvae. And so I've seen issues when it's been done too early. So before Christmas is not ideal from my perspective. Um, now, depending on the year, but in a tough year, you're more likely to drench, sorry, wean earlier anyway to save body condition on cows. and and, and my preference in tough years is to definitely, I, I get nervous doing it after February, okay? Um, because um, you might suddenly get a crash. And this year, I saw crashes with these first carvers in, um, in, in late February. Um, sometimes it won't happen until later in autumn uh, where the calves should be weaned off and, um, anyway. Uh, but certainly I, I reckon as I, I can, I'm happy to go to, to to early February, I get twitchy going to um, mid February because of that um, uh, potential risk of uh, of the type two happening. Okay, but I mean, look, if you've got a history and got away with it in the past, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, the next question from Rosalind: Can you apply uh, backline worm control at the same same time uh, as lice control? Um, 
uh, depends on I don't think there's any interaction um, I look I'd want to check with the tech uh, the tech uh, technical uh, people from the individual companies just to cover myself off on that one uh, albeit I would say I'm very have a very jaundiced view of the value of controlling licensing cattle and I'm quite happy to um, show production benefits of lice if, if they're available, but there ain't any. And, um, and, and, the, and the companies which provide the products, if they could demonstrate a production benefit of, of for lice control, then they would have it out there in their marketing straight away, but it isn't out there. A couple of things with lice, I reckon, in, and, and I'm happy to do it in really tough years, the critical time for it is in the late autumn, early winter, because that's when the rice numbers. So that's a strategic timing to do it, if you did it um, in, in tough years. And also, I think if you're selling um, stock in, in, in winter, early spring, um, it covers off, obviously, watching your ESIs, um, it, it covers off to make sure the coats look um, well as well not, and not rubbed. Just, I mean, a visual, it's just purely a visual thing. Okay, so but I don't I don't routinely recommend uh, treatment for lice. Right, thank you, John. Uh, the next question from Greg, um, which is a bit of a technical one: Should you use drench or water to calibrate a drench gun? Drench. Drench. All right. The next question from Karen: If I drench my young stock but not my older cows, will the older cows shed worm eggs onto pastures that will affect the young stock that may be grazing those pastures in the following months? Yeah, look, the, the egg output is low, albeit it, it it can still add to the contamination of pastures, uh, but it comes down to a history of property here. The, and particularly the autumn carvers in high rainfall areas are much more likely to get type two. But I, I um, so it comes down to a property history. I would say probably 20% of the um, um, autumn carvers that it would uh, don't um, ever have to drench adult cows. The majority do, but not every year. They'll do it in the tougher years all the time, but. But in really good years, they might not. In the spring carvers, it's the other way around. Probably 20% of um, herds routinely give uh, a, a, a drench to the cows in summer. And but so that little bit of contamination, yeah, it's there, but it doesn't justify drenching um, um, to from a control of pasture. I, I think you really got to look at for the weaner cattle, and it follows on from what um, uh, Ben was talking on last week. Quality of feed is really important to get keep uh, young cattle growing and not only makes them helps them they're more resilient against the, the worms uh, they pick up but also uh, the other part of the uh, uh, just plan ahead so if you and if you're all cattle you, you, you obviously haven't got as many options but um, if you've got an area of the farm you know you get bad worm problems with the younger cattle well it's time to review those paddocks and perhaps run um, older cows and calves in there um, rather than weaner cattle in that particular area just to try and reduce the overall contamination of that area. And if you've got sheep, definitely use them as part of the equation. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, another question from Marcus. Um, we have an annual rainfall average of 600 mils, so would we generally not require drenching? Uh, you'll definitely have to drench. Yeah, young cattle at weaning, and 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 then uh, it depends on your spring or autumn carver. I, I think you still follow those guidelines I showed, but you may not have to drench your mature cows. But this will come down. I've got clients in that I deal with, with within uh, with its 600 mil rainfall, um, in, and particularly in um, say Western Victoria, and they have to um, do a um, that that summer drench for the cows because they regularly get type 2 osteotagia. So it's very much a history of property sort of thing to fine tune and tweak. And then there's people up the road which um, haven't had any problems and get away with it. Okay. But young cattle, absolutely. Older cattle is much more dependent on individual property. 
Great, thanks. Uh, next one from Felicity. Is it right to uh, is it right that cattle can carry a burden of cuparia, but once ostatagia turns up, the crash can be more severe? Uh, probably is to a degree because um, uh, the uh, uh, just putting it bluntly, the the ostatagia are a much more serious worm. So I mean, you will get, like I said, you'll get small production losses with cuparia, but uh, the um, the ostatagia is more significant. And if you talk of combinations, there is some work um, in um, in sheep. Uh, and again, a lot of more of this work's been done in sheep because it's easier to do total worm counts, um, where the the production losses were more serious, where there was different species of worms involved, um, not just a single species. So. I have no doubt the same sort of principles would happen in cattle. Okay, thanks, John. The next one from Nicholas. Uh, I think you might have answered this one. Is there any problem using drenches registered for sheep on a pro rider body weight for cattle, e.g. tridectin uh, as a quarantine drench for small introduced mob of cattle? For, follow the specific recommendations for the individual products for what's required in cattle, but I'd just check with your animal health advisor and just follow um, withhold, uh, withhold an ESI periods and be really conservative with that too. So, but see, so I, I, I look at, it's difficult to answer that as a generic thing, and it's rather an individual um, uh, basis that, that, that's appropriate to answer that question. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, the next one from uh, Felicity. Does an application of lime over a pasture base have any effect at reducing the worm larvae burden if dung beetles have been pretty effective on the dung pats over the summer? Can Sorry, I, I, I missed the first part, part of that. Was the application of what? Lime. Oh, lime, okay. Uh, I've got no evidence that it makes any difference. And I don't think there's any out there, okay? But but in terms of if you've got, certainly if you've got breakdown of dung pats over summer, then um, then you, you uh, early summer, you could have a much lower challenge worm contamination of that pasture because the survival is, is not nearly as good outside dung pats. Look, and the other thing I might mention there, and you see it more on a hobby farm type uh, scenario where people go and uh, harrow the paddocks just to break down the dung pats in autumn. I couldn't think of a worse time to do it to spread out worm larvae when they're going to survive. <laughs> so, um, and, and the, prob the problem is you can't do it at any, any other time of year because it's too much grass. So um, harrowing um, at the start of summer probably would be half beneficial, but you wouldn't do because you've got too much pasture mostly. But whereas it just doing it uh, at the onset of autumn rains, it, it, it just spread those um, larvae all over the paddock. So. <laughs> right, um, there's a, not a question, but a comment um, from someone in the industry. There, for those of you interested in dung beetles, there is a rural R&D um, project looking at the types of dung beetles present in different areas across Australia. Uh, and this will have some data on the effects of drenches on dung beetles. It's not quite finished yet, but when it is. Um, and you can look at the website, it's www.dungbeetles.com.au. So if that's an area of interest, um, you can have a look on there. Um, a question from Michelle, if using Cygdectin LA and it has a shorter period of protection against cuparia, is this selecting for development of drench re resistance against the worm? It always worries me, that one. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, you, you worry about in sheep too, with uh, because tri the trikes, which are really important in sheep, um, have only worked for 50 days, whereas Barber's pole and Ostatagia theoretically work for 100 days. So, look, I mean, theoretically, it's not an issue because there's uh, the, you've got the same, you've got the decline of the this uh, of the chemical the, the window where the selection would occur. So, there's a theoretical argument that it probably doesn't make much difference. So, I'd have to draw a graph to to show you what I mean there. But the the window of where selection for resistance isn't nearly uh, isn't isn't uh, isn't necessarily 
largely different, even though they've got different um, uh, efficacy periods. But uh, it does stand to reason you'd be worried about it because there's still exposure of chemical, isn't there? But, but it just it's a bit of a quirk of the reduction in the, um, its capacity to, to kill. So, um, and that window is not necessarily any different whether it works for 50 days or 100 days. But there is there's differences, but it concerns me, but it's a theoretical argument that it's not a big issue. But I, I just don't look like use relying on the long acting as a general principle. It's it's covering up it, it's covering up what could be a better worm control program. Particularly, I reckon grazing management is such a big issue and opportunity. All right, thank you very much, John. Um, just a oh, there's another question that's just come in from Andrew. Um. And, and he's on the north coast in New South Wales, it's more of a statement. Um, he's seen on many occasions where we see 100% cuparia after Cydept and LA treatments. So. Yeah, look, it, it, it's, it's um, interestingly the, the resistance, uh, all I'd say in that property is that you've got um, ML resistance to uh, cuparia probably. Thanks, John. Uh, just a final question from Charles. Will Richmond have to wait another 37 years before winning another premiership or will it be longer? Look, I, I reckon there's a really good argument for that Richmond being the reigning premiers um, will remain so for this year. So that will actually count as another <laughs> um, year's uh, victory. <laughs> no way. Well, that's just not okay, Charlie. We, 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 we just turned off half the listeners there. <laughs> yeah, I know. That. Well, in saying that, um, that is the end of the questions for tonight. Um, and thanks very much, John, for joining us and um, for a really great presentation. As I said, they're available on the MLA website. Um, and also, I will remind you, when you click out of the webinar, please... Um, do the survey that pops up on your screen as you exit. It goes back to MLA uh, and John and myself at Home Sackett just to make sure that um, the webinar is uh, um, hitting the right uh, topics um, and we're delivering the right contact content. So uh, thanks again, John, um, and good evening, everyone. Thanks very much.